My guest on the podcast is my friend Chris Vanderkoy. He's a total shredder and the lead guitar player in the band Peach Pit. It was really nice to get to sit down with him for a while and just get to know him better. And yeah, we ended up hanging out for quite a while after, so we'll have to do another one of these one day. Uh, Thanks for checking out the podcast and make sure to follow Chris and Peach Pit on Instagram under the username peachpit17. And you can also find myself under the name Blue Jay. And hey, if you like the podcast, if you're enjoying it, subscribe to it on Spotify or Apple Music. And yeah, share with a friend. All right, thank you so much for listening. And here's my chat with Chris Vanderkoy. How are you? I'm good, yeah. Um, I am sleeping at my place alone right now. Lindsay's uh, in Whistler. And oh, nice. uh, yeah, I don't know. It always kind of trips me out to be by myself again. And just like, I think I'm always kind of excited to be like, okay, yeah, sweet. Just time totally to myself. But after one night, I'm just like, this is weird, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how I feel about this. So, yeah. Yeah. Just chilling for the weekend though. It's been good. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Are you doing any music stuff this week or? Uh, yeah, I've been trying to work on a demo and kind of learn how to record in logic a little bit more, but it's nice. like, it's, I'm just like miking uh, a blues junior with an SM 58 and trying to get some sort of tone that I like. I just drive myself crazy when I'm by myself doing it. Like, like the tone's not right, and then I'll like play a take of rhythm guitar like a hundred times because I'm just like, oh, it's just like the way I didn't hit that one mm-hmm. little moment. And then I you kind of walk away after like four hours, being like, I didn't even get anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, though. <laughs> but are, yeah, yeah, are you just going good. direct right into your interface or something? Uh, no, I'm plugged into the amp like through effects, and then miking oh, that okay. with the SM58. Okay, uh, but it's just yeah, about a lack of. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, do you have any sort of like compression or EQ happening before you go into your uh, computer? In, you in my that. effects pedals. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so nice, that. I've nice, got like nice. a multi-effects unit that kind of does a little bit of yeah. that. But. Guitars can be a little tricky at home, I find. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I've just never um, been a guitar player that likes effects uh, mm-hmm. very much. And I think it's really cool when they work really well, but like I like playing guitar where the guitar uh, and like the way you're picking it really creates the attitude of the sound mm-hmm. rather than like the type of chorus or like, you know, this type of distortion on the guitar. Mm-hmm. And um, I just like, it's like, I don't have, I feel like, you know, when, when you look at, I think I've got to say like the edge most famously like right. and yeah. how deep he got into his effects. It, it's just such an unattractive way of playing guitar to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and recently just wrote uh, a new song with Peach Pit that you mixed uh, up Granville. And, uh, oh, and yeah, love Tim, it. Tim heard it and he was like, yeah, dude, it's great. You sound like the edge. And something <laughs> inside me just like, oh, <laughs> like I actually know what you mean too. <laughs> and just for context, this is... Tim Clapp, who was on a previous podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She oh, man, that's hilarious. That. Yeah, he, so that hurt a little bit. But. Tim also finds a way to say things that sting a little bit. He just <laughs> yeah. does that. But, but they're like a compliment yeah. to him. He's like, what do you mean, man? You two is like a great band. Like, they, you know, what they did in 2006 with like a children's choir and like uh, an orchestra on their album. It's like never been done before. And I'm like, yeah, oh, <laughs> it's like... Man. The worst music I've I ever heard. I freaking love that guy. Yeah, me too. He drives me nuts, but I love him. No, he's, yeah, I've been getting ramen with him a lot. And, uh, yeah, he's just, uh, he's a good friend to have. Nice. Ramen Dombo? Ramen Dombo. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so it's been good. a spot lately. Have you been there recently? Uh, yeah, actually a few times recently. Yeah, I actually got the punch card and I'm almost at my free bowl, so nice. pretty pumped. I got my first free bowl, uh... Uh, the other day and yeah. uh, it was unreal it was like walking in there and I like showed them my card ahead yeah. of time I was like just so you know I'll be putting this on the card today and they were like oh, yeah, I love that course. so bringing it back to the guitars effects versus no effects I'm so much more an effects guy yeah but I think I also use that as I don't actually I'm not going to diminish my guitar playing like that. I was <laughs> yeah. going to say maybe use it a bit of a crutch, but I actually tend to lean towards more uh, atmospheric and shoegazy things. Like my favorite guitar player is probably Kevin Shields from My Bloody Valentine. Okay. And that you can't make out a single note he's playing ever. <laughs> it's just a wash of reverb, reverse reverb and delay. So 
that's that's where I come from as a guitar player uh, and broken social scene and stuff yeah. too from Toronto. Just that wall of sound, uh, one chord that just sort of like rings out into the atmosphere. Yeah, and um, and both those bands that you just mentioned, I are bands that I've never been able to like get. You yeah. know, to the oh, point yeah. where I'm like, oh yeah, I totally understand this. It yeah. means something to me. Yeah, you. yeah, definitely. So. I find you're more of a melodic guitar player, which I also love. I just can't do it personally. <laughs> I yeah, I don't know. It's funny how like um well actually, you know, before we go to that, I just do want to ring your bell for a second here. And yeah, yeah. I said this to you before, but one thing I love about Blue Jay so much is like your ability to not play. And then when you do play, it means so much more uh, than if you had been in before. And like sometimes you just like hit a guitar chord after it's been just synth and bass for the first two and a half minutes of the song. Mm -hmm. And it just like hits you so nicely. <laughs> and I was saying this to you, like I think maybe a month ago, we were with uh, our friends Mark and Jill and, and my girlfriend Lindsay. And I, uh, and I was like, yeah, it's amazing how little you do, but how good it is. And Jill, our friend, was like, whoa, Chris is really roasting justice tonight. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's not a roast. Like, it's legitimately oh. just being smart with Sonic. Oh, yeah, thanks, Sonic's man. Ability. Yeah, uh, I guess sort of the way that I play, it's just when it happens, it does tend to sort of take over a bit. So I always like to be tasteful with uh, when I'm doing that. And mm. I think I did try earlier on uh, to recreate my favorite band's music. Yeah, right? okay. And just the way that it worked with my voice and the sort of lyrics I was writing, it just didn't make sense to have them both there at the same time. Uh -huh. So I find I'm always trying to do this thing where I can really get what I'm saying across but still indulge in the things that I love so much about playing guitar, mm -hmm. which are those like big washes. And like, I want, I, I like to get aggressive with my guitar too and like bend it and like hear some like s strange harmonics that are different every time, mm -hmm. right? So it's like every time I play one of those chords, um, each show, to, like to me, it sounds different because I'll like push my guitar in a different way. And there's something so pleasant to my ear about pitch wavering mm. uh, over the line that is true yeah, in the sound. Totally. In the tune. Yeah, yeah. And, and just letting it be a bit more of like a random chaotic force like over something that's just holding the beat and mm -hmm. like keeping the train going. Yeah. And I mean, this, yeah, really, I think that's the, the thing I've noticed with guitar players is, you know, you say, like, I can't play melodically. I have a really hard time sitting out. Mm. I, like, <laughs> I, I, I want to be in. I'm like, what, what guitar part can fit here? And, and, you know, like, I'm writing a song right now with the guys, and it's like, uh, I really like the chorus part. But the verse part is so busy that for, like, the car to, guitar to just come into the chorus again, I'm kind of, like, getting these first waves of, like, oh man, there's just so much of like my instrument in here. And I think in a weird way, I don't know, gu guitar playing for me like has something to do with personality in a way. I'm kind of uh -huh. like that in a person, as a person sometimes, where like I'm trying to find a way to like insert myself into a conversation, for better or for worse. Like I, it's, <laughs> it's what I naturally end up doing. Not that it, it's not always a bad thing, it's not always a good thing, mm -hmm. but... Um, when I, I was talking to Bella, uh, from, a, or no, I was talking to Megan, uh, from ba a band called Brat Boy, uh, about Bella, the guitar player in her band. And we we're just talking about how, you know, like I feel like I can play melodic guitar. You say maybe that's something you're not as good at doing. Bella's like this crazy shredder, but there, it's all such a reflection of like, how you the kind of person you are and how you play the instrument and I really find it's not like I, I have a really hard time calling someone a better guitar player than another one because mm -hmm. like style is more of what guitar playing is about than uh, how fast you can move your fingers on the fretboard right. and I really love that about the instrument when you say like you know you want to just like play a big chord and let the wash like mm -hmm. fall over like like it's like the guitar's alive you know like mm -hmm. it's responding to like your subtle movements mm -hmm. and it's so cool how sensitive an instrument it can be and how sensitive it can be you know when used really melodically or yeah. used as this washy thing or used as like 
something that you're playing a million notes on and uh, right. over the span of five seconds. Like, it's great. It's so cool, though, that you can relate that to somebody's personality in that way, too. Like, for her, for Bella, is does her personality kind of correspond with her guitar playing, would you say? I, uh, I, I don't know Bella quite well enough to comment on that, yeah. but I, uh, I do think that um, I just like see a guitar player like that and it's nothing that I go, oh man, you know, I, I would be so, so much better if I could just play right. like that. I'm just like, that's the way she plays and like mm-hmm. that is such a reflection of her and like the way... I play as a reflection of me and and you know you you notice similarities between guitar players too because people influence people but yeah. overall um I think it's about just seeing the way someone else plays guitar uh-huh. appreciating it without being like oh I don't need to know how to do this to be like to to deliver guitar lines in the way that I'm best able to mm-hmm. something that really taught me to accept my own style Mm -hmm. was skateboarding oh yeah yeah uh and it taught me so many things leading in to making music that just transferred directly over and some you know embarrassing lessons some hard lessons like i started skateboarding when i was 12 years old yeah and was completely obsessed with it like I am with music and most things that I get into. Uh, Right. But something that was really cool is I tried on so many different hats in skateboarding. Like I would watch a skateboarder like Paul Rodriguez or something who has a very clean style, like the nicest kickflip of all time. And I would just be like, how can I replicate Paul Rodriguez kickflip and I would buy his shoe model. I would buy his board. (laughs) Uh, I would try and bend my knees as much as him when he landed. Yeah. The nuances of what he was doing. Yeah. Like the same trick. And then I would get super amped on Andrew Reynolds and try and like, I'd buy his America shoe and like try and copy his thing. And it was when I saw this one skate video called uh flip sorry which probably came out when i was around 14 okay and there's a skateboarder and his name is tom penny okay and there's he's kind of a legend in skateboarding this elusive character who didn't have many parts but was like the guy and parts were amazing when he had them sometimes they weren't even like crazy amazing but his style and his flow and the way that he just skated around and like kind of showed up here and there and when he did he just you could tell he didn't care and it was just all the love of skateboarding and Mm -hmm. it wasn't like about getting like the next big part in the next trans world video or something right it was just the fun and the flow and seeing that really has come over to music for me Hmm. Uh, and I just really learned a lot from him and like his attitude towards it of like, just be you and like your style's you and whatever yeah. that is, like lean into it, lean into it, have fun, just, just have fun. And, and if, yeah, if you can, um, you know, if you can end up you're a pretty healthy person mentally if you can take the desire to be successful or like uh, you know be a skater who gets the best part or Mm -hmm. be a band that has like a hit on the radio if you can like get rid of those ideas in your brain and Mm -hmm. just do it because like this is like complete expression of Mm -hmm. like me and uh and i'm just like purely about this craft Mm -hmm. it's such a for me like impossible place to get to i feel like it's this kind of like nirvana that i'll be like chasing for the rest of my life where i'm like Mm -hmm. i want to rid myself of these things just like all expectations yeah gone and i'm like you know but you're human right Mm -hmm. like you you have these things in you and uh because you for whatever reason uh and you end up not being able to do it as much as you like but you know when i hear stories about like jerry garcia just being like the most purely music guy that Mm -hmm. uh like 
anybody in Laurel Canyon had ever met kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I was hearing David Crosby say that on a, in an interview a little while ago, and I was just like, yeah, man, that's so cool, and I know exactly what you mean, and I wish I could just, like, kill the part of my brain that mm-hmm. doesn't let me just, like, experience this in a more raw way. But, uh, yeah, it's, like, something to always strive for, I think, mm-hmm. too. Do you find that yourself and Peach Pit have had expectations? Because I know we've chatted before about... Uh, the song Peach Pit, yeah, right? Which you, Lindsay, and I had this conversation a couple of weeks ago of you guys being like, yeah, like it's it's an all right song. Like maybe we'll play it in our set tonight. And then all of a sudden, like now it has over like 70 million hits. Yeah. And it, Crazy. It Not that maybe, many, but. <laughs> like, was it, was it born? I think it does actually. I looked it up today. Yeah. And on Spotify, it had like, I think over 40 million plays. Okay. And then on YouTube, it had like. Oh, that's quite a few as well. Okay. Yeah. That's a generous way to run the numbers. Yeah. yeah, (laughs) And and then, like, that's not including a bunch of other things. Like, yeah, overall, it's been played played a bunch of times. That's that's pretty nuts. And, like, I don't know, I guess relating it to this, trying to just be chill within the work you do and not having these weird nonsensical outer expectations shape the music you create. Yeah. Um, the way that you were even chatting about that song, it makes me think like, were you on that level of just kind of messing around, embracing your style? And maybe Hmm. that's why you didn't hold it to this high regard. I, I, I think that there's something about the first time you do something. Uh, and that was literally the first song we had ever written. We were all like, 19 and 20 and we were in my dad's basement and Neil had written the song and we started playing over it together and I had never written a guitar part on a song ever before once in my life and it was just like uh okay like you know and I was just noodling over the whole thing and then tried to find something for the verse and then uh and you know came up and 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 the song was really great Neil had written a bunch of songs but I there was something about like uh the drummer Tom had never drummed in a band before Peter, uh, our bass player, had never written a bass part on a song before. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, like, it all just kind of came together. And it was, this, I think it, you're right, it was an expression of just, like, the first instinct we had. Yeah. How do we play it? And, you know, that song has a lot of views. It's like a five minute and something second song. Like, it's Holy. too long to be popular or at least that's how I w- we would think about it now. And I and mm-hmm. it's one thing that I try to backtrack a little bit when you, we write today. We're like, how long is that? Okay, like it's this long because we have a label and we know that, you know, if we have a song that's five minutes and 30 seconds, they're going to try to make us chop it up. So we want to try to like make it work at a lesser time now. And, you know, that's part of the process of uh, working with people eventually. Like you you get more voices in. But mm-hmm. I think I think the uh, it's been really interesting to see the first... Uh, release the EP we put out. It's just like four songs and it really is like uh, just the most least thought through music we've ever made in Mm -hmm. some ways. Like we we were still putting effort into it. But yeah, I think the first time you do anything, you're going to have less of that. And the, and you know, I mean, I kind of feel like a, I feel a bit ridiculous quoting Picasso, but he's like, it took me my whole life to learn how to draw like a child. But mm-hmm. it's true. You know, mm-hmm. you, you want to get back to that state of just like first thing in my head, it's flowing through me. I'm not like taking it in, over-processing it, and then letting it out. Right. Man, yeah, that that song does just have such a mellow vibe to it. And it when I first heard it, I think I was booking you guys for the Catalano Festival. Oh, nice. And yeah, it's just crazy to see what it's done because hearing it, I was like, yeah, this is, this is chill. Like let's have these guys out. And you just never know what a song is going to do. No. And, and and I kind of love that about the music industry, uh, especially today is like, you know, it's not like you need to to meet some like manager or, or uh, record label and, and they'll make your song big. It's like mm-hmm. we were literally just four guys running it ourselves and like right. some YouTuber found the song and like, wow. uh, and yeah, and, and it's worked out great obviously, but it's like the wild, wild west, you mm-hmm. know? And I listen to the song now 
And I don't think it sounds very good. And it's just like me having sat with it for so long, probably. But I like notice times where the drums are just like a little bit stumbly and like the guitars just like hits off time and like the guitar comes in so abruptly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, man, you know, none of that mattered because it was just like, it it doesn't matter how rough it is, there's a vibe here. And uh, it's, it's hard to to also like not care about how rough it is because now we know how to make it not rough. Right. Back then we just didn't know what we were doing mm-hmm. and that's what we ended up with. And there's something to be said about those mistakes. I personally mm-hmm. like love to find mistakes that work mm-hmm. in a song because uh, I don't know, even especially with probably like rock music and like the West Coast vibe, there's something about having just some sloppiness and some like inaccuracies because it's more relatable, I think. I think you're completely right. Like, I think that's just the thing about, I I went into a sport check yesterday to like get some running shoes for the first time in 10 years. And I literally left sooner than I would have and didn't spend as long like looking around because the music was just so bad in there and what was playing i i don't even know but it was just like pop hit after pop hit and it was mm-hmm. so polished and I'd, i would never want to be that kind of person who's like right. pop music today isn't real music it's real music but i think the thing that really gets me about it is just how shiny it all is mm-hmm. and how like perfected uh you know the, and auto-tuned even the vocals are mm-hmm. and there's just like no emotion left when you do that for right. me you know it's just like uh, a melody line that like it, it's so simple and it's primal yeah. uh, but but it doesn't it's not relatable in the same way that a mistake might make you feel mm-hmm. like yeah you know this is just a band playing a song or a crack in a voice or yeah, yeah. something like that I, yeah, I like I to this. call it shoppers drug mart music <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but totally. I guess you could also call it footlocker music oh or, yeah man I uh, I haven't like heard yeah. a playlist like that uh, in a while and, and it was just kind of like jarring. Almost. Yeah. Well, with you playing guitar on that EP for the first time, like writing within a band context, what were you doing before that? Were you some kind of high school shredder or something? Uh, was I some kind of high school shredder? No, I've got like a pretty embarrassing past, but, um, <laughs> It's okay. We'll dive Please into share. it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah. Uh, I was really into looping for a while, and uh, nice. I really wanted to play like sets at bars, just looping, like uh, literally beatboxing into like a Boss RC three hundred, <laughs> and then playing guitar over it, and like putting the part back in and taking it out. Yes. And I like had a decent cover of like Where Is My Mind by the Pixies down, and um, and the truth of that is too is that my guitar teacher when I was uh, a kid, uh, his name is Mark Woodyard, and he taught me so much. Um, but he was doing that, and when I was in high school taking lessons from him, I would watch him, you know, do carpentry during the day and then go play these bar sets. And now he just does like uh, he gigs full time doing these like uh, looper sets, originals and covers, and he's amazing yeah. at it. He can like control a room. He's like a live a DJ playing guitar live, you know. Yeah. But uh. I, you know, I just wanted to do what he was doing. So I was mm-hmm. doing my own watered down, much worse version of it. Yeah. And that was like a real goal for me is like, I wanted to like be able to just like play at bars and get paid to do that. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. And, and I was, uh, you know, and, and I, I don't know if I can say that that like influenced guitar playing in Peach Pit in any way. But before that, I, uh, I went to youth group when I was a kid and mm-hmm. there was like a church band that I was a part of. And, and there was something super useful about playing like, every Wednesday night for five years oh, yeah. on a stage, like in front of, you know, like 50, 60 people. And, uh, it just got, got me really comfortable. Like you, you know, you learn these songs and you try to add to them. And, and that was really formative for sure. Wow. Yeah. You ever, you ever have any experience it? What, what was your upbringing like with guitar? Oh, geez. Um, I started playing when I was real young, probably around like six or seven years old just oh, really yeah just huh. playing some a couple chords uh yeah my favorite band was guns and roses <laughs> <laughs> you learn any guns and roses songs yeah i mean i've i really like that album appetite for destruction nice and i was like i had that on cassette when i was eight years old or something and was playing uh 
would start to learn the lead line to like sweet child of mine oh yeah do, 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 like really slowly in my room horribly uh-huh. and uh yeah just a couple other songs like i could play knocking on heaven's door gdc yeah and <laughs> and stuff like that and that's sort of where it all started for me and my dad plays a lot of guitar oh, too. Nice. so you know he would be playing some cat stevens songs he he really liked guns and roses too loves queen mm. and so hearing all that music was like pretty formative for me it's funny like how we were talking before about how you know you want to separate ego from the part and like not or not overthink it or over process it or or mm-hmm. um, anything like that but it's weird i find there's this common theme uh when you're learning guitar it's really about like i'm gonna learn how to play this sick riff mm-hmm. and it's like and it's about you feeling good about yourself like uh-huh. it's it's i mean for me it was, you know, and I remember there was kids in my class in high school where I was like, I learned Stairway to Heaven uh, last week. It's like, oh, you learned Stairway? Well, I learned Some Child of Mine. And then we'd go and <laughs> yeah. learn each other's songs, yeah. try to play it better than each other. Uh, because there was this weird, you know, we were in mm-hmm. eighth grade and we were trying to be like alpha guitar player. Yeah, yeah, and, totally. Uh, who's, who's better? Yeah, you know? totally the wrong reasons yeah, yeah. to get into it. But like it, uh, you know, and that mixed in with just loving the music too. Uh-huh. But like I, I would practice because I, I wanted to get good and I wanted to yeah, be able yeah. to like one up my friends. Yeah, or yeah. So yeah, even after playing guitar for a bit when I was that young, taking a couple lessons, uh, I was always getting obsessed with new things. Yeah. So through the ages of like, like skateboarding took over. Absolutely just was obsessed with that until hmm. I was like around 17. And then I started like becoming a bit more, I don't know, focused on like, oh, it'd be sweet to have a girlfriend. <laughs> and stuff. And this nerdy skateboarder like who would just, I would literally get off of school, bring out uh, this box yeah. to skateboard on and do grinds on and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I would do 100 kick flips. I would do 100 heel flips, 100 f- fakie kick flips, wow. 100 fakie heel flips, 100 switch kick flips, and so on and so forth. Your work and ethic was just... Until the sun went down. Wow. I did not do anything in school, but... What, like was in love with it, skateboarding. How did, how, I did still your, how did your pro skateboarding career work out? I, I was never that good. Never and, got that good. Uh, well, I was, I was okay. You sound pretty right? good. <laughs> I was, I was okay. Um, but there's such where music you can. There's technical ability, right? Mm-hmm. So w- we were talking about how I could play a certain chord a certain way and it can like resonate or you can shred something like a lot more melodic and that does something, right? Mm. There's more of a measurement within skateboarding of skill. Yeah. You know, you can either kick flip down a 10 stair or you can't kick flip down a 10 stair. It's not the kind of thing that, that you spend hours and hours yeah. working towards and like you might not be able to still do it. Like, Well, when you go like when you're a pro, it just seems to be at this whole other level. Mm -hmm. And I remember having amazing friends at skateboarding, like so good, like, uh, people like my friend Jay Brown, who like, you can look up some of his parts on YouTube. He's incredible. Um, and, uh, he'd be at the skate park blowing everyone's mind. And then a demo of like zero skateboards or something and with Chris Cole would come through and he would kick flip over the whole skate park. And you'd be like, (laughs) <laughs> wait a second yeah How this you guy it? you know it's just a whole different whole new level yeah whole new level and so. yeah i mean i don't know i i'd gotten skateboarding for a bit when i was in high school also because friends were into it and you know just something to do but uh and i was never like good at it i just kind of like dropping in and riding bull yeah. and doing a rock to fakie but i uh I really felt like there was this X factor with skateboarding mm-hmm. that if you just didn't have it, you didn't have it. Yeah, and I yeah. really felt like I didn't have it because I would practice an ollie and, and I couldn't do any street skating, but I would practice an ollie right. over and over again. And I just wouldn't yeah. get it. And I would watch other people like pick it up and do it way quicker than I ever uh-huh. could. And I was just like, you know, this isn't my thing. Like this mm-hmm. is fun, but I would watch people skate, uh, not even like amazingly, but just right. pretty well. 
And I'd be like, well, it looks so much fun mm -hmm. if you can do 100 kick flips or 100 heel flips yeah. or something like that. And I think people look at music the same way. It's like mm -hmm. when you watch someone play an instrument and they're having fun and like right. and and skilled, you're like, that looks fun. But what I have to do to get there is not fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how I felt about skateboarding. Yeah. See, I felt the same way too, but then I would put that kind of work in. Yeah. Just like having this sort of thing like, oh, if you just work hard enough, you can do anything. You can get there. Sort yeah. of thing. And... You know, although like it didn't develop for me, like it did a lot of other amazing skateboarders, um, I, I still look back at that time so incredibly fondly. Like mm. I, I love skateboarding so freaking much. It's it taught me, like I said, so many lessons about being nice to yourself, huh. um, accepting your own style. Uh, I grew up skateboarding in Toronto. So even at the age of like 13, I was going downtown. I would be in some, uh, you know, occasionally some like rougher areas. Yeah. And I'm like talking to these, ra you know, random people at sometimes one in the morning where we're skating a spot. Right. Yeah, totally. And it was such a cool way to learn about people because it was everyone could be different and they were all together for the same reason. Hmm. So there would be some ledge skaters who were a bit more into like hip hop and stuff. Right. So there is sometimes more association with that, like with technical skateboarding. Yeah. So you're doing tr more tricks on flat land and on smaller obstacles, but they're more technical and the style really matters and your like vibe really matters. Huh. Whereas uh, there'd be some other skateboarders who at the time people would call them Hesh. Yeah. Um, which were like really kind of tight pants, uh, listening to more like thrash metal or um, heavy rock and stuff. And yeah, it, it was just neat to see these different groups gathering together and like just like going, going to skate and yeah. like, and then there'd be like people in between, right? Mm -hmm. Like all, all the way in between that. And like just totally random people who had a completely different style. Like, yeah. So isn't, isn't that interesting about like the sport of skateboarding though? Because I, I mean, I can't say this for sure, but you know, to me with hockey culture, hockey players are hockey players, you know, right. like they're, yeah. they're, you know, dipping, uh, yeah. they're <laughs> spitting chew into a <laughs> cup and like they speak very similarly and yeah. stuff like that. And, uh, with skateboarding, like there was all of these, there's all this divide and all these different styles. And it, it is kind of like, I haven't really thought about this before, but just what you're saying, like mm -hmm. it feels like art and sport meet in this really like yeah. special place that uh -huh. not a lot of other, not a lot of other sports. Like you could call the way, you know, L Michael Jordan, uh, plays art. Absolutely. Cause it's right. like beautiful. Like he's got a flow and a style to it, but for the most part, like skateboarding really seems to, um, enhance that idea of like, uh, style and self-expression yeah. within the sport than, yeah. uh, than like a team sport. Might. And it's celebrated when somebody does have that kind of seamless flow with what they're doing people mm -hmm. pick up on it it's like playing authentic music people pick up on it they know when you're full of shit yeah right and i think that's celebrated in skateboarding and you know if you're you know come from a different background and you see somebody else with like sick style who does a sick trick you're always just giving props, yeah. you know, like I would meet, meet up at this place called, uh, Ryerson pond in Toronto and all the skaters would meet up there, small ledges. You just go say what's up to everyone. Yeah. You know, you'd see familiar faces all the time and you'd make some friends, you'd skate some spots together hmm. and that was it. Like you, you know, ha most of the people I didn't see outside of that skateboarding thing. And I guess it's kind of interesting too, that, 
um, I realize I've accumulated a lot of like really good friends in music and like we just, it's just a shared passion, right? Yeah. So it's just kind of cool to see that. And this, yeah, you're a over. bottomless well of just like wanting to talk about what you love to do. You yeah. Know? You're like that with musicians. You're like that with skateboarders. Oh like, yeah. Like I would love to talk to a, a skateboarder in, in this context yeah, as well too. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure you could dive so in depth. Mm -hmm. is, is there any, uh, is there any tricks you remember doing that the skate park, like, you know, your community of dudes, there just like lost their mind over kind of thing? Um, I mean, I was just, I get support from friends. You know? <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't doing anything that crazy, but like, you know, I, I could ollie a 10 stair. Right. It's pretty sick. Um, when somebody always attends stare for the first time, it yeah. gets the part going. I've got to think, you know, yeah. even if they p other people can already yeah. do it. It's, it's like, okay. I, I could do uh, some more tech technical tricks. Yeah. Right. Um, I won one competition. Nice. Uh, first place for uh, a gigantic game of skate. Yeah. So there was a tournament. So if you don't know what skate is, it's I, like I do a trick. If I land it, Chris tries to do the trick. If he lands it, he doesn't get an S. Yeah. But, wait. It's no. the game horse. Yeah. Uh, but but spelling out skate. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So there was like a huge tournament of that, and I won that competition. On uh, and my winning trick was a switch double kickflip. <laughs> nice work, dude. <laughs> so that was kind of that was actually cool and a moment where people were like, "Oh, oh yeah, you won a comp. Do you do you win any money? Do you remember?" I won a limited edition pair of Nike Dunks. Still have them? I sold them for like 400 bucks or something. Wow. Yeah. Nice work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that yeah. was like that was really cool and uh, yeah, but I know I just totally veered off of where I started playing guitar from, but yeah, <laughs> no, no, but I that's like okay. it. Though. But you know, I came back to it at uh, around you know seventeen. I saw some bands from my own school. There was this one ska band, yeah, called uh, the Donuts, who I really liked, huh. and they put out a really cool album. I still like it. It's it's really really nice, and uh, yeah, I saw them play at a local restaurant and just thought this is this is so cool nice I, I, <laughs> this I, I ska gotta, band <laughs> i gotta pick up my guitar again That's and awesome. like yeah i also think i had a crush on a girl who like would like the band too and i was just like oh man i need to i need to do something here yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, that definitely definitely played into like early music for me too. You know, I just wanted to be good at something. Yeah, uh, you're in it. If girls you're only in like guys who have good skills. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Truer words have never been Napoleon spoken. Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah, that movie still holds up. It does. Yeah, yeah. I haven't actually seen it in a long yeah. time, but uh, yeah, it's one of those things that I think I could yeah. probably quote the whole thing. Yeah, that is funny though. You know, you can be like, uh, it's just, I just think it's pretty universal to be severely. Uh, you know, uncomfortable at 16 or 17 when yeah. you're just trying to, I don't know, trying to be cool. Or Decide something. who you are too, you know, like yeah. what am I, because you attach yourself to what you do. Like I am into skating, I'm a skateboarder. Like mm -hmm. I'm into music, like I'm a musician kind right. of thing. And that is so much more of who you are than just like your natural resting being. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, and I mean, in a way, in a way, it's a good thing because it really gets you to try to open up to new experiences. If there's one thing I'm noticing as an adult these days, it's like I'm not um, challenging myself as much as I should be. And uh, mm -hmm. I did, like took a guitar lesson for the first time in 10 years uh, the other week. No way. And uh, the teacher sent me a bunch of um, like chords and charts and stuff like that. I have practiced them like once, man. Like that's amazing. Like the, though, the, dude. It was, it's great. I hope I continue doing it. I uh, like haven't gotten back to his email. <laughs> like people are doing YouTube covers of your guitar parts and you're going out to take guitar lessons. Like that's really awesome. And it just, you know, the learning never stops. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I, and that's, what I feel like is, is even being in the lesson, uh, trying to get new information. And like, I was asking questions, but if it wasn't easy to get these questions, it was like, 
this is so frustrating, you mm-hmm. know? And it made me want to just like, oh, well, screw this. Like, I can right. already play guitar. But it's <laughs> yeah. like, well, yeah, but I, the point is, like, growth is hard. And mm-hmm. uh, it's not straightforward, and it's going to take a few, may, it might take a few times of communicating something for it to sink in in the way that you need mm-hmm. it to. Mm-hmm. But I, uh, I just, like, notice myself... Um, relaxing more than uh more than trying to you know work my brain uh and and unlock something new uh whether it's music or something else and i just like i i it's something that i theorize is very important like i want to be able to challenge myself and then the reality of doing it is like oh, but i just i just want to chill <laughs> yeah <laughs> i on. know well it's cool that you are doing that and that's why i started doing this actually was I was frustrated with myself and this really scared me. The idea of like talking freely and perhaps like having somebody hear it. And the more I thought about that, the more I asked myself, why? Yeah. Like, why are you? You come up with an answer? Freaked out about that. Um, I think it's just insecurity. Hmm. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, that's it. Totally. Right? Just and like the idea of unadulterated, like free well, speech being interesting or not, if it's coming. To yeah. The kind of and thing. just, I don't know. It's being yourself, right. Is it to show other people that sometimes it can be, it can be difficult. Yeah, man. Being vulnerable and just hoping people are going to receive it. Mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, speaking of things that are harder to do as you grow up, I feel like, um, being, I mean, this could be different for everybody, but like, I'm less vulnerable the older I get kind of, right. you know, like I don't, I'll have friends that I don't really like dive in deep with when I was like younger, I would really like not care if this topic was right. uncomfortable, but I would go for it. And now I'm a little bit like, let's yeah. just, you know, Life's short. Let's just keep things on a laughing level. Yeah. I don't want to dive too deep into yeah. something about like how we, what we think about our inevitable deaths. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. And to me, that has always been the conversation I kind of prefer. Yeah. Right. I, I'm really, I'm really curious about how people get through this. Yeah. Right. I'm mm. curious about people's perspectives and you know with the fucking crazy ass world we're living in right now it's just great to hear my friends and people talk about what's like going on like in their lives and like just makes me like and maybe I'll be able to talk to someone one day that like gives me a perspective that like makes me understand some more of what's going on in the world but like Hmm. for now it's just nice to to chat and yeah no yeah. and i mean i think it's so important too and i appreciate conversations like this so mm-hmm. much but um yeah i don't know you know i would even say like i uh as a maybe this is i don't know if this is getting too off topic but as a kid like growing up um especially like in a christian home and going mm-hmm. to like youth group um something of value uh, that i was always taught was like depth of conversation so like when i uh, was a teenager, I learned just like how to have an instantly deep conversation. And I thought it was like a thing that made me interesting is I could like ask something really personal and like open up the conversation. But as I, you know, grew up, Mm -hmm. I realized not everybody wants to be asked these questions, you know, some people just want to laugh. And I think that, you know, everything's a balance, but was actually a good lesson for me not mm-hmm. to just like take it and just be like oh yeah like you know how do you feel about this and this and this with someone that I didn't know very well um because I've had some awkward situations where I've like brought up something with someone where they're like I'm not talking to it, you about that man <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah sometimes it's there's an element of reading the room and yeah. just how did you get there right Mm -hmm. yeah in a natural way like Uh this or are you trying to force this conversation to be something that you will then be like oh i feel good about that conversation because i really like got this person to talk Mm -hmm. about something overly deep so i actually think you know i uh I'm not as much like that kid I was, uh, mm-hmm. where I'll, I'll keep things surface level, uh, in conversation, but 
I also notice myself hunger for it uh, if I'm not bringing it up uh, right. or like not having those interactions. And even conversations like this are a total like it's so refreshing to just be vulnerable. Like I'm not thinking about yeah. what I'm saying too much. This totally. is literally like just kind of the thoughts flowing through me. But uh, it's it's a, an important balance because sometimes, man, with the fucking crazy world we live in today, uh, you do just want to laugh too, you know, yeah. like everything's so heavy uh-huh. a lot of the time. And, and if I can just meet up with some of my friends who are just like strictly make me laugh my ass off, that's yeah. like great medicine. Totally. You know? That's so needed. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Well, I'm wondering, you say you feel yourself becoming like less vulnerable with like age and I can definitely, that resonates with me fully, which oh, yeah. is again, why I wanted to do something like this is also to become a better communicator, like talk with my friends, really listen to what they're saying and not be in just a music venue being like, what's up? How's it going? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Totally. Um, and I remember when I was really young, I would think like, oh, I'm never going to be like closed off and, you know, yeah. uh, not share my feelings and stuff, but it, it is funny just over the years I, I had start to felt that closing off a bit. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, it's kind of nice to like counteract it and also have this conversation and be like, Hey, it's like cool to talk about shit with your friends or like to have those friends that you like talk about deeper stuff with. And it's not weird. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and, and like create intentional space for those conversations, mm-hmm. you know, like I had a, experience recently where I was just like feeling off like that, you know, within the last month. And, um, and I was like getting anxious and I was stressed out and I was talking to Lindsay, my girlfriend, and, and it was just like stressed out about the week. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I had to like take a second away and, um, and came back to her and I was like, you know, I think I'm actually like a little bit depressed right now. And it's really kind of has to do with what is going on in the world right now. You know, mm-hmm. like I, I hope I don't sound selfish, but like, you know, we as a band released an album this year and we had a tour in front of us that looked like so much fun. Like it was right. selling amazing. And we were like, this is it. It's happening. And then one month before this tour is supposed to start, coronavirus hit. And we're just sitting at home and, you know, we're writing, we're trying to like be productive, but, but it was like, you know, every, and we're so lucky with our career and trajectory, but everything was like coming up to this, like, this Mm -hmm. is going to be the peak of anything we've ever done, guys. Like, this is going to be awesome. And, uh, I just had to say to Lindsay, like, you know, I know people are in a worse opposition, but like, this is really like affecting me. And, uh, just the realization that we're, we don't know when, things are just going to continue as normal mm-hmm. if they ever are, you know? And, and this is hard. And I had, I realized like once I said that to her, I instantly felt better, but I bottled that up for weeks or like a couple months, just like this feeling of anxiety and uneasiness. And it was like, why did not I just talk about this instead of right. just like holding it in? And it was kind of like, did I, I don't think I used to be like that. Uh-huh. I think I used to more just like if I had a thought or an anxiety, I would talk about it. But it's so crazy how just vocalizing it really like put me at peace. Mm-hmm. And since then, I vocalized it like here I am doing it with you. But, you know, I've said this to a couple friends and even like more. It's like, OK, like I just want to share where my most personal headspace is existing these days. And uh, and talking about it is even with friends, not necessarily with a professional. Mm-hmm. It's like so relieving of the weight of like these anxieties or these thoughts. Absolutely. And I mean, those are valid feelings. You've worked really hard on something to go promote some work you've created. And, you know, of course there's really fucked up shit happening right now with with the racism, with financial crisis, with, you know, it's just like, it's, it's endless right now. Right. And it makes my problems feel small, frankly. Yeah. And it's hard to, it's hard to compare like that, you know, absolutely. But it doesn't make your feelings about your release invalid. Yeah. Right. No, absolutely. And, and, uh, I mean, uh, to be of anywhere we could be in the world right now, like Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada is like, Mm -hmm. you know, we're so lucky to live in this place while things seem to be starting to fall apart. And, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you, 
and I and I do feel thankful for that. But yeah, it's uh, it's still like everybody's own reality and own experiences are valid. Like it's you know, there's always someone who has it worse off than you. And I was just kind of like I think denying myself mm-hmm. um, the ability to just like feel bummed yeah. for me yeah, when all yeah. this is going on. But it's like no, it's okay. You know, you can you can do that. Well, I guess on the upside, yeah, is that you guys are working on new songs right now. You guys seem to be in the writing zone. Yeah. Like Neil's cranking out some tunes and you guys are back in the jam space. And we're practicing a lot. You're mixing uh, our new demos, which is really exciting. We've never done that before. And and yeah, Justice has done two demos now that I'm really excited about. But yeah, I think think the thing is when you're writing, um, the gratification process is so slow. Mm-hmm. And by the time the music actually makes it to release, that initial spark of excitement that you felt about the song is most likely uh, not... It's still there for me when we're about to release a song, but it's not as exciting as when we first wrote the song. You right. know? And the thing about going on tour is it's like just, you know, here's the song, instant feedback. And mm-hmm. that's like a, a high that... Uh, that's my favorite thing in the world to do, honestly. Playing shows with the guys and uh, to a good crowd and the vibe, when the vibe's just like really right in the room and uh-huh. everybody's just like soaking it in, there's like this trade-off of energy where like you're putting something out, they give you something back and you take that back and you put more into what you're putting out oh. and there's this like crazy exchange going on and I'm it's getting so, chills right now just I, I, about like it. you know how that feels That's you so know nice. you've played shows like mm-hmm. that and I uh, it's and a release it is a release and and to do it every single night that, is like that I've never done well I mean I mean you know not that every show is, is super amazing but I uh, but I really like that feeling mm-hmm. <laughs> and um I, I think like the the writing process is is such a different like satisfaction feeling than that feeling. Mm-hmm. So I think some bands, you know, there are some bands that don't like touring, and they're like, well, no, we're all about the writing and the studio time. And some bands love touring. I personally like would tour over be in the studio because it's that that exact exchange is is really like the highlight of doing uh, anything in music for me. So that's where you find your like maximum flow state of just you're on stage and you're it's you're like going clear (laughs) you're just like (laughs) yeah yeah, exactly no it's uh it's yeah i you don't have to overthink anything because these are just practice songs you know what i mean they're just like you've done this a million times and even like man when we get into um a practice space and we're like okay time to practice like our song off our EP 17 or peach pit. Like we're like, dude, no, we're not (laughs) doing it. We're not practicing it. And we won't practice it until like days before the show, but we'll practice every other song. But then we play it at the show and it's like, okay, this is fun. Like I like playing the song when we're here, but just for the four of us, like Mm -hmm. without the, without, uh, no one's appreciating the song in the practice space. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We played it too many times. That serotonin button <laughs> got clicked so many times that it's just like instead pushing yeah. out just like uh, angry feelings. Yeah. <laughs> we have to play it again. Yeah. But on on when you see people appreciate the song, you're like, okay, I like this song again. You know, yeah. it suddenly makes me enjoy it. You're like uh, the rat drinking, uh, or wait, what? There was some experiment where like a rat was drinking water with cocaine in it and just kept doing it until oh it died yeah or something. yeah it <laughs> just know. did it over and over just again keep pushing that button it just couldn't yeah exactly i mean that's that's anything you know the first time you do anything is always the most exciting yeah you know whether it's play a play a show or or do hard drugs or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's always and the then best. you chase the dragon <laughs> and then you chase and like here we are in a career trying to chase that dragon right. you know what i mean but yeah. i i still think you know the first house show we ever played uh-huh. is it's pretty much the same high as playing like uh some bigger venues that like we would have gotten to do on this tour right. that didn't happen and uh and you know we got that feeling off playing to 20 people in someone's living room at a house yeah. show like that that was the exact same feeling and i when i you know talk to younger bands and they're like 
viewing it as like, wow, you know, if we were doing something, if we were doing a tour like you guys were doing, wouldn't mm-hmm. that be just the best feeling ever? And it's like, no, like where you're at right now as a band is as good as it's ever going to yeah. get. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's your peak of your enjoyment yeah. of what you're doing right now, where you're just like a hundred percent passion and none of it's work kind of thing. Yeah. And that's just the reality of life is the more you do something, it's like, hey, it's a bit more work and a little bit less, uh, unadulterated passion but and again that's yeah. when the expectation starts to creep in is when you've done it quite a bit and now you're expecting yeah absolutely. to do this again and to play these shows and like I've I've had shows where I got to open direct support for a band like Passion Pit or something oh, wow. nice. uh, like a you know couple thousand people venue yeah and the next day very next day played for the bartender and the other band. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird feeling. Hey, like doing something where you're yeah. like, this is the best feeling ever. And yeah. the next day just being like, this blows. I'm yeah. going to do what I did last night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come and on. I've done that with Mark too. Right. Mm. And I, I remember we with played, Ruby Coast, yeah, yeah, we played one show in Sarnia, Ontario the day after we played, a huge show and we were just jamming with each other and it was like what it it is it does something to your psyche a little bit although like you know so grateful to play these shows at all yeah it it throws you for a loop no and i i you know when i think about my own experience with that i remember when we like played our ep release show uh we sold out a a pub in vancouver called pat's pub and it's like and I, we were shaking with excitement backstage before being like, I remember Neil going, oh, I love rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shucks. <Nerd. laughs> yeah, seriously. No, we all were though. Yeah. And then the next day we played a, a fundraiser for this like group called To The Max. They're like a ride to conquer cancer team. And I, no one wanted to see us play. Like literally all the people at this, like in this venue moved to the other side of the venue. <laughs> we're just like talking and we're like, look over at us. And, but it, we'd just be like playing our songs and it would be awkward. And I remember so well that organizer walking up to us after being like, thank you so much guys. This is exactly what we needed. And just being like <laughs> this it was so shitty, but it was so shitty in comparison to like yeah. having the ultimate high <laughs> that we had like never experienced before. And, uh, and but that's that's uh, that's definitely just touring. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like no matter what, you're always gonna still like take a step forward and then two steps back, and yeah. then hopefully a few more forward. But yeah, I would much rather be in the studio. Yeah. Than touring. Really. One hundred percent. What is it about the studio that's so much more attractive to you? I think when I'm in the studio, that's when I hit my, my flow state Hmm. and I can sit down with a song or a mix at 9am and it will be 6pm and I've forgotten to eat and drink water. Yeah. And I don't know what happens to my brain. I might be crazy. Yeah. (laughs) But that's what does it for me. I, it's that instant feedback of always playing with sound. It's communicating with me the whole time of like, and things keep appearing to me. Like I'll hear like a whoom all of a sudden and I'm like, oh, I didn't hear that before. I got, I got to investigate. Yeah. Right. It's sort of this endless wormhole of like, what EQ am I going to use? Uh, what, plug in am I going to put on it uh how can I balance this out what is it saying to me like where's the where's the emotion and like what am I trying to achieve with this and it's I don't even feel like I'm asking myself those questions when I'm actually doing it at all but but subconsciously yeah subconsciously there's just so much happening and whatever recording and mixing is is like the perfect challenge for me like perfect intellectual challenge for me where i'm not straining to the point where i'm like oh god like i don't know what i'm gonna do on this next thing yeah right um but there's always surprises because there's always new things there's always these you know new phantom harmonics or uh, uh 
some kind of energy I want to pull out of one line yeah. or something. And it, it's whatever it is, it's perfect for the brain I have. <laughs> yeah, no. And I, I love that. Like, like it's that mix of intellectualism, but also just like raw emotion, you know, like yeah. what am I trying to convey here? How, what does this make me feel? Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that slows me down, uh, about like that studio process is, I mean, I kind of feel like it's what we were, uh, talking about before where, um, it's kind of like, when you look at someone do something well, like skateboard well or play right. music well, it's like, that looks like fun. And when you have a limb, I feel like my limited knowledge of recording when I'm like trying to do something uh, in, in a program like Logic, it's like, ugh, I know what I want this to do, but I can't make it do it. And I'm just mm -hmm. shut down, you know, and, yeah. I, and I hit my wall. But I, you're a provi proficient producer. Like you can... Uh, you have the ability to like work through ideas. And I think that's something so cool about, um, about like how easy these applications are to get today, you know, a mm -hmm. few hundred bucks and you've got logic on your computer and yep. if you learn it, like you can get, I, and I love to hear you say, you know, you forget to shit and eat like those, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's a great feeling. It's the best ever. Like that's what you need to do. And like, find what makes you forget to shit and eat <laughs> and do it. Like it's, uh, it's such a good feeling when you go down those wormholes. Yeah. You know what? I think that's a good note to end it on. Yeah, totally. I think so too. Find something to do where you forget to shit and eat and do that. Yeah, totally. Not always easy to find, but, uh, but if you can, that's like, uh, it's one of the most like pure ways to work that, uh, you could ever hope to find. Actually, you know what? I have one more thing to ask you about. Right. And that is your secret Christopher series. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. that's a that's the note we should end it on. <laughs> yeah. We need to end it on that. Go to the Peach Pit Instagram and check out Secret Christopher because it's <laughs> insane. He's are you some kind of Austrian philosopher? I don't know, man. I don't really know. <laughs> it's like I don't know. I just like really enjoy Tim and Eric stuff, and uh, <laughs> okay. and I I think that you know we um, have a funny rapport within the band, and sometimes it's just kind of like what um, what really like it, Lester, our art director and and guy who does all our music videos, Lester Lyons Hookem. He came up with this idea of Secret Christopher, and he was like, I don't know, do you want to make a video video series? And it's just like. Huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> and then like we just brainstorm and it is like you're so in the idea that it gets so ridiculous that you don't we don't really have like objective view of it anymore. So it's just kind of like while wow, we're home chilling, can't tour. We're just kind of like fucking around and having fun and that's something I the never really want to The scripts are well lose. written. Oh, thanks do, man. Do you write them with Lester? I uh, yeah, we wrote like certain certain metaphors together and then I would like piece it all into like a, a script to read out. But um yeah, I uh, I've like legitimately was getting people's secrets uh as uh, that they were submitting and um, Was this as a text message or an email? Uh, yeah, it's through some app we're not using anymore called Community where people can like text a phone number and then all their texts are in an app for you. But um man, some of the secrets people were sending me were like truly dark. Whoa. And I was like man, like, this is a joke, <laughs> you know, like yeah. this is supposed to be funny, but this person's talking about like their infidelities. <laughs> and oh, I'm like, shit. okay, like did not need to know about that. Like not legitimately yeah. taking these secrets and doing anything with them other than broadcasting <laughs> them to the world. And I'm not going to do the, that with your incredibly dark secret. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's fun to just like mess around with the guys. And, you know, I feel like that's one thing we've been able to do since day one is like, what we find funny, we're just going to mess around and do. There's no sense of like, oh, we're too professional for yeah. that now or something like that. want to keep that, that sense of like uh, playfulness in it. So do you keep the secrets in your mind fortress? In my mind fortress, yeah, I <laughs> know. They're always swimming around and they're always, uh, yeah, they're, I, I think about them daily. It's quite the burden, actually. I, I really like the, uh, the secret about the fella who is the homecoming 
king and queen with his cousin. Yeah, legitimately, and, I got that. <laughs> and the and the crowd starts uh, chanting incest. Yeah, I would. Oh. I yeah, I know, man. Poor. He says he's still stressed about it. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> honestly, I feel so bad for the dude. I was like texting him oh. back and forth, being like, "What happened?" And it it's not like he went to homecoming with his cousin. It was like he was voted. Uh, homecoming yeah, king by yeah, his yeah, classmates yeah. and his cousin was uh, voted homecoming queen. But I also just like love how organized teenagers can be to like all vote a set of cousins as yeah. <laughs> homecoming king and queen <laughs> just so they can plan to, yeah. to chant incest at them for five minutes. Yeah. But um, yeah, that one cracked me up. Uh, the mostly 90% of the secrets I receive are like super dark. And there's that 10% that are like, okay, yeah. that's like pretty funny. And like right on the line. I Perfect. like the, uh, that you put some statistics in there as well. about Yeah. Cousins and- 26 out of, uh, 24 States uh, are cool with cousins getting married. Uh, cause uh, apparently yeah. though it's frowned upon, mm-hmm. uh, there's no biological repercussions. Uh, oh. so anybody who has ever had feelings for their cousin, you don't really need to feel that bad about it. It's kind of weird, but apparently, according to biology, oh, we're wow. good to go. I, <laughs> one weird of my conversation. Good, one, of my, <laughs> one of my good friends uh, actually told me that he found out he was dating his cousin. No. Into their relationship. Like they, their families were having a dinner yeah. together, and the father started chatting, and they were working back in their family lineage and found out that they had a s- shared last name. Oh, <laughs> and they were, in dude. Fact, cousins. So awkward. Uh, yeah, like yeah. a distant cousin, but still, oh, man, it's, it's just weird to find out. Yeah, yeah it's, it's things you'd rather not know. I have 50 first cousins, so I'm just like maybe subconsciously bringing this up because I'm like, there's always an odd that I, <laughs> that my girlfriend is somehow related to me, but that's okay. That's just the way my grandparents did it. You know, like yeah. they had 14 kids, their parents right. before them had 14 kids, their parents before them did. And well, at that point, like they're responsible for overpopulation. You know? Oh yeah. Well, in some places there's actually some apps yeah. to check if you're related. Nice. I think in Iceland, that's a big one, but like small populations like that. Yeah. yeah it makes sense. And it's hard to tell. Um, even in some spots, uh, like in China, uh, Linda was telling me that, um, there's only like so many last names. Yeah. And so people have to like look up and see if they're related because, uh, because I everybody has the down. same last name. Yeah, I wrote it down actually. There's uh, so there's around four thousand last names that are used in China. Yeah, uh, the top one hundred last names make up over eighty five percent of the population. Whoa! And the top three last names are Li, Wang, and Zhang, uh, and those alone account for over twenty percent of the population. That's crazy. Like why? I mean, I don't know. At that point, I don't I don't need to be problem solving for China, but you know, like I'm just like, why not just make some new last names? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you I mean, know, like who knows? Yeah, who knows. But that would yeah. be stressful. So, um, you know, you might be dating your cousin, you might not be, and but it's you okay. just you never know out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, Keep your stick on the ice. Maybe folks. we should have uh, ended it before, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, I'm going to leave uh, the editing up to you. Yeah. Okay, well... um, Pleasure talking with you, man. This has been a real treat. Thanks so much for chatting and stuff, and hopefully we can do it again soon. There's so much I still wanted to to ask you, but... um, Hey, maybe another episode. Yeah, we'll get to it. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I'm always always around. Okay, see everyone. Thanks for listening. Later. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And check out the Peach Pit Show at the Commodore this Thursday, September 17th, And you can get the tickets at peachpitmusic.com. Also, livefrominside.ca. Thanks for listening. Check out Peach Pit on Instagram under the username peachpit17. And follow me at BlueJay. Also, subscribe to the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts if you dig it. All right. Thanks so much. And thanks to everyone out there sharing this around. I really appreciate it. Have a good one.